We have spent a lot of time in this opening segment talking about shoes and specifically shoes you should consider if your walking for you will involve more than you are used to. <laughs> As a reminder, we've suggested looking at the Shimano RX6 gravel shoe or the XC5 cross country shoe if you're going to be doing long stretches of walking and a stiff race shoe will likely do you more harm than good. Shimano has a shoe stiffness scale that is a great guide. For better walking, you want to stay away from anything that reads 9 or 10 on the stiffness scale. Right. Now, you may be wondering, what can I do to make up for that loss of stiffness when I am on the bike? Like, having a stiff shoe can really help with that power transfer. So, what does it mean when I go to a more flexible shoe? Yeah, I've actually been wondering the same thing at a very personal level. I, I love my XTR pedals and I can pair them really nicely with the S-Fire XC9 shoe. So that combo makes pretty good sense 98% of the time. But, you know, suppose I wanted to go for a more flexible pair of shoes. I don't know if the XTR pedals have the platform to support my very low cadence mashing style of pedaling. Well, not to worry. Shimano makes an XTR pedal in a trail version. Now that pedal has a bigger platform than your standard XTRs. The XTR trail would be a great combo for someone on a more flexible, walkable shoe. In fact, I have experience with this combo. When the XC5 first came out, back when there was a Interbike show, remember those days? <laughs> I, do. I got a pair and paired them up with the XTR trail pedals, and that combo works great. In fact, Mrs. Hottie is also loving a similar setup. She is on the RX6 shoes, or in them, I should say, and on a set of XTR trail pedals, and she's quite happy both on and off the bike. Yeah, to check out all of Shimano's shoe and pedal options, it is bike.shimano.com. And thanks as always to Shimano for being the title sponsor of this show. Leadville, the podcast for the 100 mile mountain bike race presented by Shimano. It's season six, episode 17 of the show that breaks down, builds up, gets you ready and freaks you out for the highest, hardest one day mountain bike race in the country. I am Michael Houghton, hotter to most. And I am Fatty. And this show has two very distinct sides to it. On one hand, we're going to be talking about being in the Leadville 100 and possibly pulling out. And on the other side, we're going to talk with someone who looked like she was out, but then stayed in. I will be talking about a major hurdle that I am currently hurdling. <laughs> it's between me and the 2023 race. And we have a discussion with Allison Tetrick and how she overcame some serious bumps in the road to make it to 6th and Harrison and back. Yahoo! What is a good strategy for staying ahead of the cutoff times? What do the experts say about sleeping effectively at altitude? And what do you each do for Leadville? Hardtail or full suspension? Yeah, good question. All right, it's Leadville Frequently Asked Questions, LFAQs, and this one is personal. Fatty, take us away. Everything's personal with me. Uh, I'm going to get to why it's personal in a sec, but recently we ran a poll on Facebook's Leadville 100 participants page asking folks whether and why they have ever had to defer their entry to the Leadville 100. Now, of course, this is the least scientific of all possible polls since it is a self-selected set of respondents in a highly biased group, but it's still interesting and had some surprising results for me. Yeah, that poll drew 123 votes and 38% of you said you've never needed to defer. 58% well above half of the folks who responded have needed to defer from the LT100 for one reason or another. Self-selecting poll or not, that is significant and reflects the reality that in between lottery sign-up day and race day is about three quarters of a year and a lot of life can happen during that time. Yes, it can. Breaking down the reasons of why people indicated they deferred is pretty interesting. So 16% of the deferrals 
come from family reasons. And people mention birth of a child, college graduations, the marriage of a child, and so forth. Honestly, this was the only group that had happy reasons for deferrals. Lack of readiness came up next with 14% of the deferrals, and this one was the one that surprised me. Only 5% of deferrals happened for job reasons. And I like that people aren't letting their jobs, their careers get in the way of doing a bucket list race like the Leadville 100. Mm, the hell with work. Yeah. It's the Leadville 100. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going. <laughs> hey, but the largest group of deferrals was due to health or injury reasons. Two-thirds of all deferrals happened because something had happened that would make it unwise to ride this race this year. Yeah, so whatever the reason, a meaningful number of us have planned on doing this race and then have had life get in the way. You, you want to do the race, but it's going to have to wait for another year. So let's talk for a moment about what your deferral options are for the Leadville 100. Historically, the LT100 has had a pretty harsh deferral policy. You could defer your entry one year, but your money was forfeited. All the deferral got you was the knowledge that you wouldn't have to re-enter the lottery or re-qualify in a race. You did still have to pay full price for your deferred entry. Yep. From an organizer's perspective, that approach kind of made sense. Ken never made any pretense that this race was about something other than making money. <laughs> so every racer with an entry paid full price every year. No exceptions. For 2023, the Lifetime has quietly evolved their deferral policy. If you go to the deferrals page on the Leadville Race Series site, you'll now see that up to 90 days before the race, you can defer to the following year and repay 50% of the entry fee, which is quite a bit less racer hostile. Yeah. After that, you know, for the 89 days leading up to the Leadville 100, you, if you got to defer, you're going to need to go back to the old policy. That is, you get to keep your place in line for next year, but you got to repay the whole entry fee. And I expect our listeners uh, who have calendars already know, uh, as of the air date for this episode, we are at fewer than 70 days from the Leadville 100 for 2023. Right, which means this new racer-friendly policy doesn't apply to us right now. It's worth knowing for people who sign up in 2024, but doesn't impact racers right now. Yeah, it is worth knowing for racers this year, though, that the last day to defer at all for 2023 is Friday, August 4th at midnight. <laughs> I don't know if they actually have a gate that slams shut at midnight, but basically, if you're going to defer, make sure you do it, you know, sooner than a week before the race. So we're almost 150 episodes into this podcast, and this is the first time we've talked about deferrals. Tell us why you've been polling about deferrals on Facebook, Fatty, and deep diving on Lifetime's deferral policy page. Okay, I've got a story. <laughs> Everything's got to happen roundabout for me. You remember episode 14 when we uh, focused on grips? Yes, I do. Yeah. So I will always remember that episode because... Uh, you know, a little behind the curtains thing. Hottie does the edits of the episode. I write the title and the blurb and uh, handle the posting and releasing of the episode. In this case, on episode 14, I did my part while I was wearing a paper hospital gown as I waited to be wheeled into an operating room for a C2 to C5 spinal fusion. Yes, of course, I've, I've known... You've been out of commission for a while, and recently we compared our, our matching scars. I've had a similar surgery myself. Mm -hmm. Different vertebrae and for different reasons, but I, but I get it. So so this deferral conversation, are you saying you're not racing this year? Well, I haven't deferred. Um, at this point, There's the, it doesn't buy me anything to defer, right? Uh, I will say I have not turned a crank in the three weeks since I've had the surgery, and I'm still a week or two from being allowed to get on even a stationary bike. Uh, so if you check out my Strava, <laughs> go to leadville.fm slash fatty, you will see that there are a lot of nice long walks, but no bike riding in the last little while. But um, for me, the Leadville 100 this year is almost exactly three months after my surgery day. And the surgeon says at that point, I'm allowed to do anything I want. So... I thought about deferring, uh, obviously been doing a little bit of research on it, asking some questions about it, but for me, it doesn't appeal. Uh, I want to go to Leadville. 
I want to line up and I want to see what it feels like to, you know, essentially kind of in a way, punch the reset button and start over with this race. But it is going to be a new kind of challenge. Mm -hmm. Well, we know you have till August 4th to make your final decision on this, but what's your plan in the time being, for the time being? Well, uh, I, I'm going to let it be fluid. <laughs> I, I plan to start riding on my stationary trainer and get myself into the best condition possible. And I have basically two months to do that. I'll be using a lot of trainer road, a lot of Zwift. And then I'm going to show up at the starting line. Uh, as we noted, deferring won't save me a nickel at this point. Um, then I'm going to ride the very most conservative Leadville 100 I have ever ridden. Um, my target is going to be finish in 11 hours and 30 minutes. But if I'm hurting, and I might be, I have no idea how I'm going to feel at this point, uh, I, I'll eject. There's a lot of convenient places to leave this race. <laughs> uh, and then 2024 will be my 25th finish instead of 2023. Mm -hmm. Well, Mrs. Hardy and I will be crewing for you, whether it's uh, for the 40, 60, or 105 miles this year. Obviously, you you can eject if you need to right there at Twin Lakes Alternate. We'll be standing by right there. <laughs> and, of course, we'll be there for the hammer and any other Nelson hand tools that might be riding in this year's Leadville Trail 100. Uh, since our grips episode, I have continued to experiment with different types of grips, and I want to thank SQ Lab for sending a, another pair my way. I am now on their Trail and Tech 7-Elevens. This is a clamp-style grip and a little more ergo than the 7-Eleven R's. That's their race version I had previously tried. It's a little heavier, the standard 7-Elevens are. Much easier to adjust, nice contouring, but not quite a wing-styled grip, so a good one for Leadville, I would say. We also talked handlebar dimensions in that show with our friends at Envy, and one thing we should have mentioned was using a stem to help get your bar rise to the correct level. Yeah, in addition to handlebars with different rises, Envy also has stems with different angles. The standard carbon stem is the racier uh, minus six degrees drop that comes in lengths that start at 80, go up to 140. Uh, kind of old school, considering that most mountain bike frames are longer from the seat post forward nowadays. But if you still need more reach, there you go. Plus, you can always take that minus six uh, stem, flip it, and you've got a positive six, <laughs> which is what I've done. Now, most of us will choose one of Envy's zero rise stems. You've got the carbon M6 stem, again, zero rise and sub 100 millimeter in length. Envy also has an alloy stem. Yes, we said alloy and Envy in the same phrase there. <laughs> uh, that has the same dimensions, but is a little heavier, about 60 grams, depending on size. Yeah, so if you love your bars, but you wish you had a little more rise, check out Envy. The product specs are easy to follow. And you can go the easy route by swapping out your stem, your hands and back. They're going to thank you. And the best carbon wheels and components are, of course, always at envy.com. That's E-N-V-E dot com. One thing we've recommended ever since season one of this show is to have a drop bag that you leave at the top of Columbine. Because Colorado summers are unpredictable. If, uh, if there's anything that can be predicted, that it's going to be there's going to be rain sometime <laughs> at the top of Columbine. And if it's going to rain at 12,000 feet, it is going to be cold rain. And there's a good chance there will be some nice freezing wind to go along with that. Yeah, there's a good chance you'll have a beautiful and clear descent coming down from the turnaround at Columbine. But you can get a, a lot of peace of mind from having a few items in a bag just in case. Yeah, and this year, Joe Sepulveda, who is the CEO of DNA Cycling, He's going to be racing the Leadville 100 for the first time, and that guy knows his cycling clothes and has what I would call a very smart recommendation for your Columbine drop bag. It is called the Duo Jacket. Yeah, this is a jacket you will find uses for well beyond L the LT100. The Duo convertible jacket may be the most versatile piece you'll own. It's warm enough to layer up for a cold winter day or descent from 12,000 feet, yet cool enough for those chilly spring and fall mornings. Yes, you may want it at the starting line with that in mind, uh, you know, and stash it in your jersey pocket for the rest of the day. You never know when you might need it. Weather changes in a snap in Leadville. Also, the sleeves easily unzipped create a really functional wind-resistant vest that will keep you warm and dry all day long. Yeah, love the convertible jacket vest thing. It's great. Uh, we're overdue for a bad weather day in the LC100, and a jacket like the Duo 
could wind up being the most important article of clothing for the day, whether you bring it to the starting line or have it stashed in your bag at the top of Columbine. Find the duo convertible jacket at dnacycling.com. Okay, let's get to the other half of this show's theme, Leadville Speed Bumps and Hurdles. Our guest of this show knows a bunch about overcoming adversity. Allison Tetrick has been on this show before to talk about how to stick with it, and she's back again to inject some enthusiasm into our preparation. Allison has been through the ringer as a pro cyclist, crashes and concussions. Allie could have thrown in the towel multiple times. Even a run-up to last year's Leadville presented a challenge that could have stopped her race before it started. But she always gets back on, and it has paid off. She turned her road career into a successful gravel career. She uses her social media as a platform to spread positivity and enthusiasm. And she has earned a spot alongside dirt racing royalty. Allison Tetrick also has humility, a dose of self-deprecation, and is one great storyteller. Okay, Fatty. Hey, we're excited to welcome back to the show, Allison Tetrick. And yes, I said welcome back because, uh, you know, like in Saturday Night Live where they hand out the five-timers jacket, I think we're getting close here with Allie. This is her third time on the show, so she's going to, like, earn some type of jacket or, I don't know what, buckle maybe? Since it's, yeah, it's a, it's a buckle-based podcast, right? So maybe we do something like that. Who knows? So yeah, this is uh, Allie's third appearance on the show. I think, uh, Allison, the first time we had you on, you were kind of prepping to do the Leadville Trail 100, and then that got canceled by COVID. So we must have had you on in 2020, I guess. Um, and then we had you on another time when when Fatty went out to find folks and their kind of their most disastrous stories they had on the bike. And he chose you. And it was part of our part of our owning it series, as we ended up calling it. And you were part of that series. And I, I want to play back something for you. You told us for that series. This is quite a story, folks, about, well, just call it a kind of a nutrition faux pas. Go ahead, Fatty, play the sound bite. I was in the yellow jersey at Nature Valley Grand Prix, and I thought, you know, these these criteriums are, you know, U.S. Pro criteriums, and they start 4 or 5 p.m. So you ride in the morning, you try to take a nap, eat breakfast again, because you want to try to recreate that race experience. And, um, there's that song that goes, the party goes on and on and on, on and on and on. <laughs> and so I made a smoked salmon egg like bagel. And the whole time in the crit, I'm in the yellow jersey trying to defend every sprint points. And if anyone knows me, I don't sprint. So I'm like vomiting smoked salmon, trying to not <sighs> lose any points. And then in my head, it's just the party goes on and on and on. <laughs> so oh, Welcome back, Allie. <laughs> I still make the same mistakes. Don't get me wrong. I just got off the trainer and I made like, you know, chorizo tacos before. Like, why not? Life's short. Eat good food. Just don't sprint afterwards. <laughs> <laughs> oh. So, I mean, food poisoning before a, a crit, man, I mean, that that is brutal to live through. Uh, I think that we might have something that can top that today because you have now raced the Leadville 100 and we have not heard your story. So uh, it, it wasn't in 2022, but in 2021, and I have not really, uh, I mean, I, I haven't heard the full story. We want to hear it today. Oh boy. This is um, some uncharted waters or... <laughs> woods that we are covering <laughs> right now. Uh, but yes, we had a lovely time discussing the prep into Leadville, which I can offer a lot of intel and how the prep worked and ultimate strategy on. Um, I am not new to long distance racing. This is all above 10,000 feet. Everything's et cetera, very hard. But as you guys also discussed, prior to my inaugural and only mountain bike race so far, <laughs> the Leadville 100, I'm one and I might not be done after I get off this podcast because I have a feeling you guys are going to um, elbow me in a little bit there. But um, that's right. I, um, oh goodness, I need to start a little bit like we can go into prep and everything, but ultimately I did some really good prep into it. I, I, 
wasn't intending on racing to win. I was intending to race to do sub nine hours, mm-hmm. which I think is very capable for me to do. And and I want to give a little bit of background because you mentioned in passing that this was your first and so far only mountain bike race. But it's more than that. You, until you started prepping for the Leadville 100, didn't even own a mountain bike. You were literally, I mean, you were a straight up road and and you were transitioning into, well, no, I guess by then you had actually won Unbound. So you were a gravel racer, but it was definitely drop bar racing that you had done to that point. And so you were coming into Leadville in some ways very green. Extremely green. That was my first and still to this point only mountain bike race. Um, So my lovely boyfriend at the time who has since married me. So I'm just going to tell you there's hope for everybody. If you make this guy (laughs) do lead boat with you and he's never ridden that long in his bike in his life. So you and your now husband were doing place or planning yeah. not just to do leadville but the lead boat that is leadville and then the next day mm-hmm. the steamboat uh oh my gosh mm-hmm. <laughs> that's just mean <laughs> in my defense i wanted to do it and i was like i'm doing this he's like yeah babe go for it he signed himself up and wrote an essay and got in on his own accord okay so he did this to himself he did this to himself. Okay. So he, he, <laughs> He's like, well, I want to do what she's doing. And um, yeah, we were just dating, just dating. Obviously, we knew we were, <laughs> we were going to be together forever. But um, now we're married. So I can't believe that we actually survived Leadville. So that's the main story or lead boat even. I know I can't survive Leadville unless I do some altitude. It does not mean I'm good at altitude. It just means I can survive. I have never performed well at altitude in my entire career. However, altitude training camps, we can get all geeky on that if you wanted, make me perform very well at sea level or something lower. So I, I am a high like responder, but I'm not a high performer at altitude. So I can train at altitude and then come back down. That's probably better for another podcast you guys do, but it's super geeky. But I can like, I get like so strong training at altitude. Not that I'm strong at altitude but when I come down. So we had this whole trip planned to go, you know, we went to Utah, we, well, Tahoe, Utah, and we drove our big old truck, Overlander truck with a rooftop tent. We're like camping, hanging out with friends all the way. We're training. I wasn't planning to win. I just was like, oh, I'm going to, I would like to do sub nine hours, which I told you guys on your podcast that mm-hmm. like, that was my goal. Yeah. And to go for me, the big buckle. To me, that was my goal. And I thought that was, um, I could accomplish that. If I, I had to do some altitude. So six weeks at altitude, cause I need six weeks. I can't do three weeks. Mm-hmm. S- three weeks doesn't work on my body. Um, I need either come the day before or do over six weeks. Yep. That's just my physiology. Everyone's different, but that's mine. And so we, we were all up, 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 up all the way. And then we got to Boulder, which is a little low, but I could do some power, which is nice. Mm-hmm. So, you know, you're looking at about. 55, you know, 100 feet or so. That's nice. And then I was planning to pre-ride the three critical sections of the Leadville 100, which Scott Tietzel was going to take me on. And he's a dear friend of mine. And Scott Tietzel has done what? Like, is it, it's 10 Leadvilles under seven hours or eight hours? What is it? Well, his stat is incredible. Oh my gosh. I, well, I mean, n- neither is anything to sneeze at. So he, he's a fast guy and has done it 10 times. <laughs> 10 times and all under, I'm least going to say eight, if not mm-hmm. something faster. I should have looked up that stat prior to this. So sorry, Scott, I love you. Um, so he was like, I know exactly, like we'll drive up there. We'll do these three sectors. And, you know, so now I'm like four or five weeks into altitude. I'm like, I'm feeling good. We get to Boulder and I take a town cruise just on my gravel bike. I don't know, to get donuts or something. I just like crash randomly and I like Mm. bump my elbow. Not bad, but you're like, oh, I just lost a lot of skin on my elbow. And I was like, oh, that sucks. I come home and Blaze is like, wow, that looks bad. I was like, it's fine. And then four days later, I crashed again. And this was actually a really bad crash. Kind of like where your bathtub just looks like murky, bloody water. Um, Oh, I hit my head really bad, too. And so 
I just knew there was some issues. So I was like, well, I'm not racing Leadville so are, anymore. So are we talking like warranty your helmet bad? How I mean, how bad was your was this second crash? I cracked my helmet and definitely <laughs> was concussed. Yeah. So time in the hospital and it, it, not not really. And you are someone who already has experience with a TBI, traumatic brain injury. And so this is a, I mean, it, it's serious. The more often it happens, the more serious it is. And B, something that is, it probably occupies a bigger part of your waking moments than it does for most other people, right? So yeah, who would, I, I, who would not pull the ripcord? I was a week and a half out, so I had planned to pre-ride the course that week. Obviously, I couldn't. I did no riding or anything prior to even riding Leadville. Mm-hmm. I, I talked to medical advice. I, I 100% and I had my life partner there with me and, you know, Tietzel was there with me as well. And I, I went to doctors and everything and I just like laid low. But the fast pace that I had planned on was not going to occur. And then safety. No, it's out the door. Yeah. Safety and health was my priority. But I just like, I'm like seven weeks on the road to prepare for this. I was like, I am just so excited to do Leadville. And you guys hyped me up on it. And I was hyped up on it. And it was such a beautiful experience. Um, so anyway, so the lead up to it was not ideal. So, um, I got like some bandages on my knee with like ooze everywhere. And I'm starting, um, you know, in the pro corral because that's what I am. Not really at mountain biking, but I am technically on paper. And, and they're looking at me. They're all my friends. So it's all this is all in fun. And I just got this like oozy leg. I'm missing like my whole like elbow. Like, But I had a great climb because I'm like. I was fit. I had trained for it. So I had a great climb. So you go up Kevin's and my coach told me it's chunky. I didn't know the word chunky existed. I didn't even see any chunk. I was just having the time of my life. I'm like riding, I'm talking. I'm in the front group all the way to the first stop of the climb. I'm having a blast. And Blaze is staying with you. Well, I told him he had to. (laughs) And he's like, if I ride with you, Al, up that first climb, it's going to be really hard for me the rest of the day. I was like, I need you on the descent. Because you do the first climb, that's it's great. It's lovely. It's got some racks. I'm like having the time of my life. I'm like talking to people that like ultimately win the race. I'm like, this is great. And then we hit the descent. And his job mainly was to go down that descent with me, power line. Because like everyone told me, oh, like power line's like a fire road. I was like, that ain't a fire road. I just went down. I like to follow somebody I trust on descents, even in road. I don't, do you guys, do you guys like to follow a lead? Absolutely. If you are confident, if you trust the person, then having a, having a wheel to follow on a descent can be the, a huge difference in time and in, and in confidence and comfort. So yes, absolutely. I like following a a good trusted line, but that's, that is absolutely key. How do you, you agree? No, I like to lead. Yeah. And I'm not even that fast of a descender, but I like to see as much trail as possible. And I find that bikes in front of me mean I can't pick up trail as well. So I do like to be in the front going downhill. I'm a follower all the time, even on the road or gravel or like I like on descents, I like to follow I, and I buffer like I'm like a couple bike links off. And if like I call it like a canary, like a yellow canary, <laughs> there's a big mud puddle. <laughs> there's like a rock. I'm like, oh, he didn't make that. He's in the bushes. I will go the other line. <laughs> Yellow canary strategy. You can just like trademark that right here. <laughs> so that was Blaze's main thing. I said, all you got to do, babe, is climb with me. And then when we descend, you have to like shepherd me through the descent and then I'll just see you later. It's not like we're doing weird team tactics. Also, I'm not racing. Like I'm riding it and I'm having a blast. And we're going down and we have 2,000 people behind us trying to pass or however many people, but it felt like a million. And they're trying to pass and I'm going, I don't know. I think I need to go to the bathroom. Like, but like never would I go to the bathroom in a race. Like this is like new to me. This is like a hundred percent like new ground. Like I'm like, no, like if anyone ever has those problem at Leadville, I, I feel like it's a thing. It is a thing, actually. It happens quite a bit there. More than you, more, I know you're, this was your first time and you were experiencing hell on two wheels, but it happens a lot there. And a lot of it's just, 
gets chalked up to pre-race nerves, early morning start, and altitude. I mean, that'll screw with anybody, right? So it's not, it's actually not surprising. So I got out of the way and that worked out and we got to the bottom of the descent. He did lovely. And then I didn't see him again till the finish line because he's like, just go. So you were feeling better. It's, I mean, head was okay. You're you're on a mountain bike, but you're feeling comfortable. And because yes, essentially from mile, uh, from from mile twenty to mile forty, you are more or less on the equivalent of a really good gravel race. That was like my jam. I was having so much fun, and then um, yeah, it was it was a great day. I. Um, yeah, I had a blast, went up, you know, I got to go up Columbine and all of that. I mean, nothing was, everything was great. Coming down Calum- Columbine's a whole nother story, uh, but. I am interested in how you felt coming down the first part of Columbine, from the turnaround till when you were back on dirt road again, till you, the part that we all call the goat trail. How was that for you? Because that is a lot of people going in both directions on a very narrow two-way track. Um, terrifying. Yeah. Like, if I didn't have to do that again, I'd be happy. Um, I think I'd rather descend power line than do that. Uh, I, you know, I, 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 was, I was having an okay day. I'm not, like, winning or anything, but I'm having a nice day. And so I get to see my friends that are racing to win. I get to cheer them on. They say, go alley. I'm going up. They're coming down. It's so nice. Like, mountain bikers are so nice. And everyone was cheering me on, and I'm cheering them on, and I get to cheer my friends on that are winning, and also just people that you see. Like, ah, oh, I just, I love the community, the camaraderie of the entire day. Uh I didn't particularly love that whole goat path section, not sure. going to lie. Well, and it, that is, it is scary. And, and you know, having done this 20 plus times, it is that part is scary for me every single time. But at the same time, you also experienced the Leadville secret sauce, which is for a little while at least, you know, everyone is within a few feet of each other and you get a chance to see both the fastest and the slowest people in the course. Everyone sees everyone during this race. And if if you're lucky, you get to experience what you experienced, a lot of people cheering you on regardless of what speed you're going. It's a pretty remarkable experience, and it, it can't be discounted. It has literally brought me to tears. I don't even know how many times, just how much I love everyone at that moment. It's just this, yeah, you're all in it together. And when it sucks, like you're walking your bikes because like one person dabs and the next 150 people need to be walking because there's no like room to pass. But we're just like making fun of each other and having fun, like in a nice way. And I get to watch my friends, like I said, like send it down. My problem was (laughs) when I was coming down, I'm still like not that far back, but I was so terrified because I'm a liability. I was like, there is going to be an article that like I was the bowling ball and all these little like pins. And I'm like, I want that line. And I, I'm like, I don't trust myself enough to like, for these people's like health (laughs) and wellness. And so I started walking the descent, but I, I like, it was, it was so crowded. I was like, I don't know where to go. And everyone was like, go on, Allie. And they were so nice. Go on, Allie, you got this. And I was like, ah, I mean, my bars are a lot wider than I know how to handle. What if I clip you? And then, like, some people, like, some guys, like, can real send that down that. Like, they're, like, bawling past me. And they're, like, yelling at me. And I'm like, I'll, I'll get out of the way. I'll just keep walking again. You can go. I don't care. Like, I'm good. And I think the best was somebody who was like, Allie, you're so great. Um, just don't get out of your comfort zone. Just keep doing you. And I was like, oh, I love these mountain bikers so much. (laughs) In a way, I mean, you have to appreciate that something was happening to you that doesn't get to happen to most pro cyclists. And that is you were an absolute beginner again. It has been a long time 
since you've been an absolute beginner. And it's it's a great reminder, right, of what normal people experience. You were having a very common first-timers Leadville experience. And I loved it, though. I, I will just I will just say, like, I talked to some other of the pros and they're like, wait, people are nice. Like, I was like, oh, no, they're really nice, especially if you go just like, I mean, I was like not slow, not fast. Like I just but everyone was so nice. Yes. And like it, 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 the middle of the section of the course. So after that, I'm like smooth sailing, you know, getting down, calling by because once I hit the gravel. I was like, even the gravel descent, I was having a blast. I just want to make sure I was keeping every other rider coming up because they're also a little cross-eyed trying to make the time cut. So as coming down there, I wanted to make sure that they had a good day and I don't, you know, you don't take the line you want. You have to take kind of different lines to make, to ensure rider safety. Um, And then you get to the bottom of that and I was just railing and I... I was just like, boom, boom, boom. I had so many carrots. I had so much fun. And I was like, somebody ride with me. They're like, ah, you're going so fast. But I was like, I feel great. This is amazing. I did the Columbine. I'm done. All I got to do is like, now I'm not scared. I'm not scared to go up power line. I'm not scared of going down. Like, I'm not scared of that. I just like, so I was having so much fun. So I was just like, I literally was like begging guys to like, just draft me. I was like, please just draft me. They're like, I can't pull. I was like, don't just like ride with me. I don't want to be alone anymore. Yeah. Riding, riding with a group. It is one of the real pleasures of the race. We're going to cut Allison off for just a second here to remind everyone. We will have part two of our interview with Dr. Alan Lim coming out real soon. This show is going to be more of a race day uh, focused with a segment by segment eating and drinking outline. And we are going to go into the kitchen with Alan to talk about cooking like a pro. So back from Allie to Alan, we got it all. And speaking of Alan, I got my feed box the other day. And what do you suppose was in it? Well, scratch lab drink mixes. Actually, it's not my feed delivery. It's Mrs. Hottie. She does all the ordering in this house. (laughs) Yeah, that makes sense since she is the queen of the feed zone at Twin Lakes Alternate. But it's good to hear you practice what you preach on this show, drinking scratch and getting it from the feed. Yep, we uh, go with the tried and true scratch sport hydration drink mix. This is the OG scratch drink mix developed in the pro peloton, then turned loose on the public. And like Island told us in that first interview, this is hydration, not fuel. Oh, there are some calories in it, but just enough carbs to aid in hydration. Most of your hourly fuels will come from something else. Yeah, when I'm using Scratch, I will usually be taking on a gel or two per hour to keep up with the carbs I'm burning. But if you like to drink your calories, Scratch now has a super fuel that you can use to fuel your Columbine climbs without destroying your hydration. It too is available at the feet. It seems more and more the fastest off-road racers are staying brand specific for both hydration and fuel. So whether that be Scratch or Never Second or SIS, you can find all of it at the feed. Okay, back to our guest, Allison Tetrick, and one of the craziest Leadville rookie stories I can remember. Once you were down from the bottom of Columbine, it, obviously there is a lot more of pain in store. The The race doesn't really uh, doesn't really punch you in the face until you are climbing the power line. But the stuff that can scare a new mountain biker is more or less behind you by the time you get down off uh, and down off Columbine. Well, I had a blast. And so my, though, one of my other greatest memories of Leadville until we get to some of the bad ones where um, I cleared all of Powerline. You rode Powerline? The entire thing. That's impressive. Riding the Powerline. I mean, that is uh, that is a serious accomplishment. And I'm like going up it and this, like, you know, the pizza guy and the, you know, everyone's like, I, I chugged a beer at a Coke. I'm like having a nice time and I'm having a great time. And this woman is like, just in a freaking outfit and having a blast. And she like gets like, cause I'm going so slow. Like I'm going the speed that people are walking. Right. Like, I don't know if riding is actually more efficient. However, I was just having a nice time. So that's what I wanted to do. It was like a buffet going up that too. Like, I mean, cause you literally are going that slow. I was like, I can like eat and drink going up this thing. But the Rocky section was a more, like I did all of that. And I was like, I had this lovely guy that 
like I met and he was just like my friend. I followed his line. I had a great time. It's kind of fun to be in some zone of the race where you can enjoy it. So power line, you clean power line as a rookie. That That is amazing. I'm over on that thing on race day. Um, so terrific job there. I don't think it's actually more efficient. Like I said, well, yeah, I'm kind of sure. the, the way you got was... there wasn't the greatest, but nonetheless, I mean, you clean the damn thing. Yeah. So that's great. So any other major events getting back to that red carpet at 6th and Harrison? Not really. No, I just met a lot of friends. Um, it was funny because where I was in the race, I guess like you're saying, like an age group zone, um, I could climb a little better. They could descend faster. And so we just like yo-yoed around, but we just heckled and laughed. And we I just had so like much camaraderie there. And then like getting into the finish, I think I started crying. I was just really proud. I was like safe, never crashed. I rode within my limits. Like I, I chose my health over any sort of result. Um, didn't have a bad result. It wasn't what I had planned for, but due to the circumstances, it was exactly what I wanted. It was just a solid day on the bike, and I was a little euphoric. I finished, um, pulled out my phone to see where Blaze was. 34 miles away or something like that. You finished it 10-10, and he had a third of the race left to go. I, I Now, I'm always a little bit cross-eyed and goofy by the time I finished the Leadville 100, so I'm not sure I would have been able to do the math as I crossed the finish line, but you had to have been a little bit worried about whether he was going to make it. I was worried about whether he was going to make it. I was also worried that we made the biggest rookie mistakes of our entire relationship was that he had the keys to the truck on his person. <laughs> also my beer and food ticket on his person because he doesn't trust me with losing them without losing them, which I will. <laughs> but like, why, why did he have, like, why weren't the beer and food tickets in the truck and the keys like hidden somewhere on the truck? So you had no way to change, no way to get food, no way to... <laughs> I borrowed like a dollar fifty from somebody on the street and bought a hot dog. Again, testing that GI strength. Allison Tetrick, she'll gamble with anything there. <laughs> wow. The hot dog. Okay. That's cool. <laughs> so like Fatty said, it was ten ten for Allison Tetrick. And then uh, Blaze came across on eleven forty five, so got a buckle out of the deal too, which is great. Um Fatty, I say what we should do here is is tap into Allison's analytical skills and have her, have her turn those skills on herself here and do a little what I did, what I did wrong, or what I change, right? So we know for sure, Allison, you would eliminate the two crashes in your preparation. Uh, you'd uh, probably eliminate whatever caused you to pull to the side of the trail um, the morning of or on race day. But what in your preparation um, would you, or, or your training for that matter, do you think you might change, do different or, or not at all? Maybe did you get, do you think you got it perfect? I think I would change a few things there. Uh, definitely riding the mountain bike a bit more. Um, this was during still COVID era where supply chain was very difficult. So getting a mountain bike in time to ride it and train on it was, hard and it still can be hard to this day. So I more time on the mountain bike, but I'm, I'm not going full Kate Courtney on you guys and doing like cross country races, but some endurance, you know, just more endurance time on the bike, because as much as I said, Columbine descent and power line descent was scary. The rest of it is just, I mean, to me, it was very conducive to my road biking skills, but Maybe a little marathon mountain bike race to prior just to get used to that um, different like hand position because riding gravel and road riding so often you have like a myriad of opportunities uh, where to put your hands and on a mountain bike I find it much more uh, challenging because I feel like there's one position I mean yeah you can do a little tuck but the control issue that's just for pavement um, I think I had my nutrition dialed. I mean, obviously if I'm still laughing and riding at power line and having beer at the race, like I don't think I was suffering. I mean, I wasn't pushing my limits. We were going to talk about aid stations, which you guys, everybody well knows now I was not intending to race it. I just wanted to do an effort 
slash finish, which I didn't have any doubt in my mind, barring catastrophe. And so I didn't have any aid stations out there, but I did drop a camelback, uh, another camelback chase fest at Specialized, and they would have 100% given me full support if I asked for it. I was just like, oh. they're like, what do you need? And I was like, nothing. Just like, can you take this camelback for me? <laughs> I think I'll be fine. And I got there, I stopped, they had like pickles and chips. So I was like, oh, this looks good. This is fun. <laughs> So did I hear that correctly, that your feed zone strategy was to make one stop or no stops? Or what was the strategy and how did it play out? I made one stop. One stop. Okay. (laughs) You remember that was outbound at Twin Lakes before the Columbine climb? It was coming. It was coming back from Columbine. Hmm. So 60 miles in. Wow. That's a long ways to go without without a refuel. I have 1.5 liters on my back. I got two bottles. I don't know. I did stop at the turnaround on the top of Columbine, but I was kind of shaky and I didn't, it was very high up there. It's very, very high. They're like, what food do you want? I was like, I don't know. Let me put this hypothetical on you then. If you were going for speed for um, a podium, what have you, a big buckle, would you have changed that strategy to include more hand ups or more stops or, you know, carrying less weight with you around for 60 miles? I don't think I would do less weight because um, I prefer to be fed um, and not worry about feeds because sometimes there could be some chaos in the race. And I know I am um, a minority there because I watch the fellow racers in gravel at least do that. I I just like to have I, I like to say like I have all like my baggage with me. <laughs> like I like to carry it, you know, um, I, I think a hand up. But the speeds through the hand up were so high. If you miss your hand up, I just don't want my whole day being screwed up that I miss. Because the hand ups were not in like particularly slow zones. Like one of them was like, I was going, me, not even in the full bike race was going over 20, which I can do that because I'm a road racer and all that. But like, what if you miss it? Because you do miss them sometimes. I'm I'm doing this hand signal. Sorry. (laughs) They're like staring at me. But like, you know, you grab them like your hands backwards, right? You grab it that way. And I'm like, what if I missed that? And that was your like livelihood to like saving kilos up the climb. I don't know. Um, I, well, I've seen this happen before. Mm-hmm. It happened to Payson, in fact. Payson McKelvin, been a guest on the show. He had to stop, turn around, and pick up his bottle. I mean, his, his feeder missed. They dropped the bottle. He just stopped, turned around, picked it up, and then kept going. The other thing you do is you employ the hottie <laughs> uh, feed zone strategy or just employ us, period, and we set up two people, right? And so if you want a hand up, if Allison Tedrick wants a hand up, I stand, I stand and I'm the primary person and then I put a backup bottle further up the road in case you miss me or we drop it and there's a backup bottle as you get further. And then you don't have to stop. You just keep riding and, and grab the backup person or you take the backup bottle too if you want it. So that's the answer to all that. I think, yeah, for a time, don't stop. I, I have bad advice on there, but I did enjoy not caring (laughs) like i was like somebody has a camelback for me it'll be fine and there's so many nice people out there (laughs) yeah i get that too there's something totally liberating about that too you're not reliant on anybody that way if you need to stop you can grab a neutral feed zone there's plenty of those there's obviously a total of four two both ways uh, you can grab those. People will help you, too. I mean, you're going to see Yuri at the bottom of Columbine. He's standing there handing out goose. So there's 800 ways to feed yourself up there. And you just carry a lot of your own stuff. You know? Yeah, I saw Yuri out there. No, and this if I was racing 100%, I'm going to be like, boom, you know, like in Unbound, when I race that, I'm, I'm in and out of that in 45 seconds. And you only get two aid stations for 11 hours of racing. So it's, you know, like, I'm just like, Camelback, pizza food. Let me chug that IPA real quick. That does happen sometimes. Say, Ali, I was wondering, maybe you could help some of our listeners with something. I'm sure they, you know, they struggle with it, whether they know it or not. In fact, this podcast in itself can be um, maybe sometimes a negative in the fact that we, we tell people you got to get ready and you got to get, you know, geeked up for this thing. You seem to have struck a balance here that maybe you can help others with. And that is, you know, training, training hard, uh, having a goal, but keeping it fun, right? So is there something you could tell folks to, while they all, they do want to be focused on this and they want to have their goal, but how can they still keep it fun in the process? The whole thing with goals for me is 
<laughs> setting a goal that actually inspires yourself, like, or, or inspires you, um, and, you know, so is it sub nine at Leadville for the big belt buckle? Is it to win? Is it to, like, finish for the other really cool belt buckle? By the way, I can say from personal experience, it's a pretty cool belt buckle. Um, but, like, what if it's just finishing? Or, like, what if it, like, isn't this event and it's something else? So it's not taking all this pressure that people give you that says, like, this is what you need to do. You need to be an Iron Man. You need to be a Leadville 100 sub nine hour you need to do this you need to do that like what do you want to do and if this is what you want to do hell yeah let's do it and then it's about finding people that you enjoy that you like that don't stress you out (laughs) that encourage you that are your accountability partners that can get you out to help you accomplish your goal and then it's so cliche but honestly the journey is worth so much more than the end result And so that's where I find the balance is like, am I having fun doing this? Am I enjoying riding my bike down the coast last weekend going Mach 30 with dudes that are annoying the hell out of me because they're riding so fast. But at the end of the day, I'm like, that was amazing. Yeah, I do like this. You know, so it's like, it's finding that balance. And then other days, I'm like, I don't want to do that. And this isn't my only identity is where I place the world championships, where I place at Leadville, where I place it unbound or anything like that. I am so much more than just a cyclist. You know, I'm a, I'm now a wife, but you know, I'm a daughter and a sister and a granddaughter and I'm so much more. So it's, it's that balance where you can find joy in being able to have the blessing and privilege to be able to train in that journey to your ultimate goal. But always though, I have noticed once I hit that pinnacle and I'm standing there, that sounds so weird but like you're standing there and you won or you accomplished your goal it's not my goal or like my belt buckle or my trophy that I am relishing I'm like relishing all the moments that led up to that and I know that's over said but have fun with it and then also the other bit of advice when shit goes haywire like don't take yourself so seriously right like you puncture, you might have a fluky crash, you might have to evacuate the dance floor. Like there could be a lot of things that can happen. And that's when you have to like (sighs) deep breath and then like reevaluate what you want to do with that day and like how you can still have a good time. Like, do you want to like PR up the climb then? Cause you're like so off the back or do you want to just finish or do you see a buddy that needs help and you want to stop and help them? Like there's so many ways you can turn around a bad day and it's about your mindset. And also that sounds very like lame to say, but it's not, it's, <laughs> it's just like, you know, like mud gets in your tires, you're digging it out with a stick. And instead of just being frantic and being like, my life sucks, my day's over. This is the worst day ever. Like change it. Like I like, like, that's what I say is too, is like, if you're not having fun, change it. And like, how could you have fun? That could be to go like ape shit on the next climb and go as hard as you can. Or it could be like, I'm going to take a shot of this whiskey out of my pocket and just like chill the F out. Or it could be like, oh, I'm, I see my friend. I'm going to ride with them. Like there's so many ways you can change your day to make it positive and not to take yourself so seriously and also evaluate what you can do. Because sometimes just stuff happens, right? Well, in addition to uh, everything you've done, the 10 years of pro road racing, winning Unbound, three times a winner at Gravel Worlds, the OG Gravel Worlds. Uh, the 1010 at Leadville, which is great. Um, you're also one of us. You're a reporter. I mean, you've been doing this great job um, with podcasting and spreading the word of, of pro women cycling. So tell us what you're up to on our side of the fence. What are you doing? Uh, well, first of all, Blaze, my husband and I own a business called Saga Ventures, where we sell bandanas to get more kids and more girls and bikes, just open up the opportunity in cycling, which is super cost prohibitive. So we provide scholarships through NICA, Outride, we work with Love Your Brain, and when we go to races, we raise money for the local chapters there uh, of bandanas, of all things. Uh, so that's kind of fun. That's one of my other things. We work with brands. Um, Blaze has his full-time job. Uh, this is my full-time job is this. <laughs> so uh, I I had the pre- like the privilege of working with Zwift. So launch, um, helping with their branding activation and creative concepts um, all the way into the Tour de France FOM of X Zwift. Uh, and so hashtag watch the, mo- uh, watch the FOM. 
uh, is a big deal for us. So getting, yeah, just more visibility to women cycling because visibility is viability. Um, so I'm a podcast host on the move covering all women's road cycling. And there's some cyclocross and gravel in there too. Well, for the folks who've made it this far, they, they recall that we started off the show with a Allison Tetrick highlight. It was a great one from the time she was on back in season three. Um, there was another half to that story or, where Allison talked about seeing stormtroopers while uh, and she was in a complete daze, out of her mind during a race. I believe, I believe it was during Unbound, in fact, where uh, she was having hallucinations and seeing stormtroopers. Uh, believe it or not, uh, she went on to have successful races at Unbound, so much so in the gravel community. The gravel community itself has said, Allison Tetrick, you belong in the Gravel Hall of Fame. Now, I don't know if it was for seeing stormtroopers, probably for the winds, but stormtroopers may have had something to do with it. Allison, also, we want to say congratulations on your induction into the Gravel Hall of Fame. That's pretty cool. Oh, I'm so excited. Thank you, guys. Um, I cried a little bit, but there's so many deserving people out there um, that have really been paving or leaving unpaved uh, sort of road for all of us. And uh just it's incredible it's what you guys are doing it's how we can get more people on bikes mainly and just make this an incredible place for people to be vulnerable evacuate the dance floor i'm just gonna keep making that joke i'm sorry (laughs) but really there's so many amazing people that like help me get here to where i am and uh you guys are definitely included in that so thank you oh thank you Allison, it's been such a delight. Thank you for being on our show. Oh, I love being. This is my favorite. Like, it's like freaking best time ever. (laughs) Again, thanks, Allison Tetrick, for her insights and enthusiasm. Even the best cyclists have their struggles, and it is always great to hear just how moving ahead can be rewarding. If you'd like to hear more from Allison, please check out her Instagram. Her handle is AM Tetric. I suspect you'll find a few pics of her very recent Gravel Hall of Fame induction. Blaze makes a few appearances too, which is great uh, on her Instagram feed, I should say. Not on the show yet, but certainly on our Instagram feed, so you can find him there too. Let's wrap this episode for now. Fatty and I are on social media as well, just like Allison. I'm not as prolific as her, but I am on Instagram at Michael Houghton. Fatty wants you to check him out on Strava. Yeah, you can get to my profile real easily by going to leadville.fm slash fatty, where you will see no recent bike rides at all, (laughs) though I am Strava-ing my evening walks. And you'll find both Fatty and me on that Facebook Leadville 100 Mountain Bike Participants page. If you want to have a deeper conversation, join our Slack channel. You'll find a link to it over at leadville.fm forward slash Slack. If you like this show, please go wherever you listen and give us a five-star rating, write us a review, and you can check out all the ways to find this show at leadville.fm. Good luck in your riding, your racing, your recovery, whether surgical or otherwise. Thanks for listening, and we're going to see you in fewer than 70 days at the starting line.